Professor of Metabolic Research at Weill Cornell Medical School, where he is the director of the Comprehensive Weight Control Center. He's the current chair of the American Board of Obesity Medicine and is also a past president of the Obesity Society. He edited the NIH Practical Guide to Obesity and is the co-author of more than 90 papers and book chapters. He's won several awards, including the 2015 Stern Atkinson Award from the Obesity Society for Distinguished Public Service. He's also the CEO of BMIQ, a free cloud-based weight management system for healthcare providers. Dr. Aroni. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. It is a pleasure and uh, an honor to, uh, to be here speaking to you uh, today. Um, as you know, I have nine minutes and 50 seconds, so I'm not covering all the topics that I'd like to cover, um, but I'll do my best. I, I want to give you a flavor for how we are now treating severe obesity and what it takes to do that and how we're going to build an infrastructure to treat severe obesity in, in the country because th that really is, is the challenge. Here are my disclosures. So what does it take to treat severe obesity? And I think a critical part is an experienced team. You need bariatric surgeons. Gastroenterologists are becoming a big part of our team. Our gastroenterologist has done more than 200, more than 200 procedures. Patients want these procedures. They seek her out to do these things which are not as effective as you've seen, but our role is to figure out how to make them more effective. And we're finding that if you add what the gastroenterologist does to what we do in medication, we're getting very reasonable but less than surgical results. You need an obesity medicine specialist. And I'll tell you a little bit more, and Dr. Bob Kushner, who has really been the leader in this movement, um, will tell you more later about the field of obesity medicine. We use registered dietitians liberally, psychologists, support staff. You need the proverbial village to treat the patient with severe obesity. The problem is that most communities don't have that. They do not have it. They may have a surgeon, they may have a registered dietitian, they may have the psychologist, but they don't have an obesity medicine specialist. They don't have the, the support. Uh, the patient has surgery, they go back to the primary care physician, they don't get the kind of support and intuitive care that uh, is necessary in managing problems when they arise. Now you need treatments that work, and we've heard about lifestyle, medication, surgery, and devices. The key point I want to make is that these all work together. So the idea that someone has surgery and they're cured, okay, that is not true. I don't care what anybody says, people are not cured. And so you constantly have to be watching to see what do you do next. So someone who has bariatric surgery and they have type 2 diabetes, we'll put them on metformin at the drop of a hat. We will give that patient metformin if we see they're starting to get hungry, if their weight plateaus at a higher level. Now, we won't force them to take it, but as soon as we see someone starting to have difficulty um, from their bariatric surgery, we will add a medication that maybe they were on before. Because one of the most interesting things we're finding is the medicine that for, for weight loss, that can contribute to weight loss, that doesn't work before bariatric surgery works after bariatric surgery and has an additive effect. Sometimes it's even greater than it would have had uh, beforehand. And I'm going to show you some data uh, from a paper we just published that will illustrate that. And finally, we need insurance coverage for that treatment. And we're lucky uh, in New York, and one of the reasons why I think we've made so much progress is that many of our patients have very good insurance coverage. But Without coverage for the care, it's, you, you can't do anything. You can't see, see the patients. Now, here's our division of metabolic and bariatric surgery. And on the far left, Dr. Alphonse Pomp, um, one of the real leaders in the field. He was one of the first people to do a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. And on the far right, Dr. Greg Dakin, who runs the um, uh, surgery residency program and all of the, the support team that, that they have. And this is what uh, we bring to the table, which I think is unique. Because while many centers have a bariatric surgery program, they don't have 
a comprehensive weight control center. And our center was set up as a model to make other institutions jealous so that they will do the same thing. They'll come to our center and say, oh my god, I can't believe what you have here. I want the same thing. We have five physicians. Two, two of them are endocrinologists. One is a nutrition uh, specialist. And uh, we have a nurse practitioner who is only doing remote monitoring. She has 75 uh, patients who she monitors remotely with remote scales. Uh, some are in far suburbs of New York. I don't know if you've driven around New York, but you know, driving from uh, Nassau County to New York City can take you two and a half hours. So we're remote monitoring patients uh, aggressively and she is getting great results. She can monitor their meds, she can change meds, it's really working out quite well. Now another person we have in here is uh, Devika Yumashankar. She is our fellow. Now there are only three or four obesity medicine fellows in the entire country at the present time. So she's probably the rarest person uh, in, in this group. But the point is that it's hard. We need to build an academic infrastructure for obesity in the country. We need more fellowships so we can train clinical leaders who can go to other institutions. I recently was at a major institution in uh, the Midwest. They just hired more than 15 obesity researchers. They have a huge surgical program, huge regional surgical program. Not a single person there knew how to prescribe medication for obesity or could manage people in a medical manner. Not, not one person there, and we've offered to train somebody so that they can get, uh, get with it. And then finally, we have uh, students, we have uh, graduate students from Columbia's Institute of Human Nutrition. We are the most popular. We're, we're Cornell. Uh, Columbia, as you may know, is across town. They will actually take the cross town bus or walk all the way across town because we provide, I think, a unique experience for them. So obesity medicine, I, I, I know Bob Kushner is going to be talking about this. It's the newest specialty in medicine. Uh, it's a certificate of conf competence, and it is growing rapidly. I just wanted to show you this slide. Uh, so since uh, under the leadership of Bob, we started in 2011. Uh, look at the number of, uh, of physicians. Uh, so these are MDs and DOs who are getting certified, really uh, major advance. So let me make uh, an important point. Why do people gain weight, and why don't they just lose weight? You know, you're yelling at them, you're screaming at them, they know they should lose weight. And the answer is that something physical changes in your brain when you gain weight that makes it hard to lose weight. Something about the environment, fattening food is turning out to change hypothalamic signaling pathways in a way that makes it hard to lose weight. And if you don't believe me, there are several, there are a number of papers that are showing this. This is one from uh, Michael Schwartz at the University of Washington and colleagues. Obesity is associated with hypothalamic injury in rodents and humans. And here's another one from Dr. Jeff Flyer, the former dean of Harvard Medical School. Remodeling of the arcuate nucleus energy balance circuit is inhibited in obese mice. So it's clear that part of the issue, this is not the only issue, is that when uh, animals, and we believe in humans, weight is gained, that is a sign the damage is occurring in critical circuitry. So basically, your brain loses control of how much food is coming in, how much fat is stored, and it keeps telling you to gain more weight, either by eating too much or subtly slowing down your metabolism. So there's uh, the yellow uh, arrow showing where the injury is. It's to pro-opio melanocortin neurons. There's a lot of work that has shown this. So this is not a hypothesis. The evidence is growing. And in fact, it's been fixed. Dr. Flyer has shown that if you give nerve growth factors, you can cure obesity in animals. So I believe that this is showing us for the first time that we need to change our approach. So when you look at where the centrally acting medicines work that, that we use, they work in the exact same part of the brain. Isn't that unbelievable? 
they work to stimulate signaling through this damaged part of the brain. That's why they work. And that's why it's going to have to be a chronic treatment, like treatments for diabetes, hypertension. Okay, if patient stops taking the medicine, you yell at them and say, don't you know that you gotta take your blood pressure medicine? Don't you know you have to take your diabetes medicine? <clears throat> Obesity is pretty much gonna be the same thing. So what kind of strategies work? There's management of drug-induced weight gain. We find that a lot of our patients who have surgery don't do as well because they're taking medicines that prevent them from losing weight. There's treatment with anti-obesity medicines, and there's use of intensive intermittent dietary interventions. And we're using all of these to maximize weight loss. So this is from a paper we recently wrote in the Journal of Family Practice. Uh, look at how these anti-diabetic drugs affect body weight. So on the left, you see ones that cause weight gain. On the right, those that cause weight loss. And if you to have a patient who's taking ones in the left-hand column and switch them to ones in the right-hand column, what do you think happens? They generally lose weight. So let's look at it. Here's a patient, AC, 69 years old, BMI 36. His A1C was great. 6.2, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He had a lap band 10 years ago, lost 36 pounds, regained all of his weight. And he was, when he first saw us in 2014, he was on pioglitazone 45 and metformin 500 daily and many other medications. So this is his weight chart. So you can see the weight loss followed by the weight regain. He was at the highest weight ever. And what did we do in December of 2014? This was a guy who could not comply with a diet. He said, I don't know, you know what I'm doing here. I'm not gonna listen to whatever you tell me to do because I just can't stick with a diet. So what we did was we increased the metformin, we weaned down the pioglitazone, and we gave him liraglutide, injectable GLP-1 agonist. And you can see that over uh, a year and a period, he lost a lot of weight, lost about 60 pounds. We saw him recently, saw him uh, a few months ago. He's uh, 194 pounds. It's been stable for uh, a year and a half. So this is just from changing his medicines. We gave him dietary advice, but voila, all of a sudden he was able to comply. And here's another patient. Um, this is a woman with uh, bipolar disorder. Initial BMI was 56. She had a complex surgical history, had a lap band, performed in Greece. She lost uh, a significant amount of weight, but not enough. She then had a ruin white gastric bypass. The bypass was then banded. And then in 2011, we started her on medication. And again, you can see uh, the history, uh, 2011, she was gaining back the weight. And this is a patient who was referred by our surgeons. They didn't know what to do. Uh, we started on medicine, and you can see that she's done quite well. We actually saw her two months ago, and her weight is um, 147 pounds, something, something like that. So uh, changing her medicine uh, has been, uh, had a dramatic impact on her weight. Um, we've studied this uh, systematically. This is a retrospective review we did with the Mass General, uh, looking at our patients. You can look at this when you have a chance. But what we saw was that those people who had a ruin y gastric bypass, uh, who got basically the same medicine as those who got a sleeve, lost more weight when medication was used. And what we found was that probably the best time to start medical therapy is when someone hits a plateau. Because we got the same weight loss whether you had hit a plateau or regained weight. So you could get to a lower weight if you were at the plateau. Uh, so we think that this is a strategy that should be encouraged in patients who have, who have surgery. So when we look at the difficulty we've had, we've had this treatment gap at the low end and the high end, and now we're beginning to fill this in at the low end with new medications, with less invasive procedures, and at the high end by adding medication to bariatric surgery. Thank you for your attention.